I'm going to now turn the program over to our sponsor, Francesca Vogel from Home Care Assistance. Francesca? Good evening. I'm Francesca Vogel with Home Care Assistance. I'm the Director of Business Development, helping clients and families navigate the complex world of elder care. I was raised here in Walnut Creek by my grandparents, which explains my passion for seniors. I've worked in elder care for the last 28 years, and I've partnered and worked closely with many legal financial professionals here in the community. I'm on the Professional Advisory Council for John Muir Health and the board president for Mobility Matters, providing free rides for seniors in Contra Costa County. Also, I have two pet therapy ponies that I visit seniors in communities. And my dog Roman is the first pet volunteer with Continuum Hospice. I would like to take a minute to share a short video what we bring to the senior community. But before I do that, just so you know, Home Care Assistance has offices throughout the Bay Area as well as the country. If you need something, I'm here anytime, night or day. You can reach me on my cell phone at 925-989-6877. Again, thank you for having us and we're proud to be a sponsor. We got the... You got it? There we go. One sec. Passion in them. The passion to take care of people. Then what we're looking for is, is their background and the thousands of care of our employees that we have at Home Care Assistance are really the lifeblood of our company. You know, what Home Care Assistance looks for in a caregiver is, is first and foremost, a big heart. We have to see the passion in them, the passion to take care of people. Then what we're looking for is, is their background and experience. It's all about the match, because we can put a warm body, but if we don't have that solid match, it doesn't work. We're really putting somebody that we would put with our own parents we just love our caregivers so much. That's why they stay with us for years and years. We really value them. We, we take good care of them. We provide medical benefits and 401ks for our caregivers. And most importantly, the respect that we give them because without them, we're not gonna be here. They really like us because we're so nice to them. <laughs> Whatever they want, we give it to them, you know? And we're always working together to provide the best possible care for a family. Thank you, thank, everyone. Thank, thank you so much, Francesca. Uh, Francesca is a valuable resource and um, is part of the community. I'm sure we all know someone who has made um, use of their services over the years. I, I, I discovered that I did have many people who knew of Francesca in, in, my, in my group. So um, I'd like to now pass it over to um, David Erb. David is uh, a member of our Contra Costa Board of Directors, and he is the chair of the Education Committee. David? Thank you, Anne, and thank you all for attending. We're really excited to have everyone here to kick off the speaker series. A lot of work goes into this behind the scenes. Um, you know, Doug and Samantha did most of the work. As you guys know, it's a seven part series. The whole goal here is to give practical education to our members so they can get some great practice tips start new practice areas or just learn more. Um, we have some other series that go on, but this one, as you know, is specific to um, elder law. And so without further ado, um, Samantha is gonna kick it off by introducing the speakers. So thank you so much. Thank you, David. And thank you everyone for coming out, out tonight and your living rooms, hopefully watching this on Zoom. Doug and I are excited to start off this series and we're really excited to have great two great presenters today and they're actually non attorneys. That's even better. It's a different voice. Um, today we have with us Jane Moore. She is an older adult advocate and navigator. And we also have Jill Judson, who's a private fiduciary with CSC fiduciary. So we really want to thank them. And as we're going through the series, I just wanna remind um, those of you who don't know that the Contra Costa County Bar Association has an elder law moderate means panel. So if you're looking to get some experience in some of the cases or the topics that we're talking about in the series, it may be a good idea to uh, become a member of the panel to see if you can pick up cases that way. 
but regardless of how you pick up your cases in the in the area of elder law intake is probably one of the most important um, parts of, of the case it's getting to know what your client wants and needs and if you can even help them so today we've got presenters that can help us communicate better and hopefully do a, a better job at intake so we can make sure that we fulfill the client's needs so without further ado doug is there anything else you'd like to add now you said everything wonderfully. Thank you, Doug. Without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with Jane Moore. Jane Moore, please take it away. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. And start going. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm new at this, so hopefully it all goes smoothly. I'd like to thank Samantha, Doug, and Ann for organizing and herding the cats and the Contra Costa Bar Association uh, for this opportunity to um, talk to you and give you a little bit about um, insight from my side, which is, as Samantha said, the non-legal side. I've been working for over 20 years, um, 25 years with older adults and uh, both in the nonprofit world and at John Muir Health where I've been there for 15 years. Um, I gather information to ultimately help people which is really what the intake process is all about. So it's always been a part of my job. As I started preparing for this, I realized what I do is intake in almost every aspect of my job. Um, I got involved with older adults kind of by accident. Uh, we had a, a gentleman who used to walk up our street every single day. You could set your clock by Ernie. He would come up the street at 7.30. He'd go down the street uh, at 5 p.m. And he was going up the hill to a neighbor's house to help her do grocery shopping and just be a companion. And everybody knew Ernie. Um, we always offered him a ride home when he was going home, especially in the winter when it was dark, but he always said, no, no, my doctor said it's good for me to walk, so he would walk on down the hill. Uh, until one day when he didn't actually accept a ride from me, and I was kind of surprised, but I was happy to give him a ride. And he always had dressed in a suit, tie, whole thing, every single day. So when he got in my car, I kind of noticed, oh, you know, the suit's a little shiny, the cuffs are a little frayed collar around his shirt is a little dingy and he's got a couple spots and I kind of suspected that maybe he only owned one suit and he put that suit on every single day to come up the hill to help Betty and um, shortly after that he started um, really accepting rides every single day and I'd make it a point to kind of be outside if I was home around five o'clock so I could give him a ride down the hill and one day my son came inside and he said mom Ernie's outside leaning on the phone pole and he was out there. I went out on the porch and I said, hey, Ernie, he says, I need a little help down here. And boy, was that the truth. You know, by the time I grabbed my keys and went down to my car, he was already in the car. And I come to find out he had no family. Um, you know, Betty was kind of deteriorating and he didn't have anybody to help him. So through help with friends who worked at the county and friends in the VA, we were able to get him some services and you know, get him in some better shape before he um, finally passed away. So that's kind of how I came to uh, be involved with seniors. So that brings me to the point of who is your client? Who are these people that we are seeing in our, um, you know, in our businesses and in our lives and in our work? And, you know, the reason for the meeting that they're coming to you is because their life has changed and it may not be a, uh, for the better. It probably is something that's caused them great stress. And the term elder, older adult, senior, it's really just an, a number. Um, I've worked with 70 year olds who had multiple problems, health problems, uh, emotional problems, family, uh, mental capacity. And I've worked with 90 year olds who are sharp as a tack and still living on their own, able to drive, pay their own bills. So the term only gives you an age bracket. It doesn't really tell you who you are working with. And that's really what we need to understand. Uh, I've been working with a 93 year old woman named Yelda and we had a referral. I currently work at home health and we had a referral to have a nurse go out and see her. And I called her and talked to her about it. And she was very hesitant and very clear and, and explained to me why she didn't really wanna have the service now. And so I told her I'd call her back the following week on Tuesday. Well, I called her back the following week on Monday and the first thing she said to me was, you weren't supposed to call me till Tuesday. 
So I explained to her why I'd called, you know, I was checking in and seeing how she was doing. And uh, we had, a, you know, more of our conversation, kind of a repeat of the first conversation. And by the time it was over, she kind of agreed, maybe it would be a good idea to have a nurse come out and see her. But, um, you know, she knew exactly what she was doing. She was completely tracking. So the age, her age of 93 euros, years doesn't really mean anything. It's just a number next to their name. So the work really begins understanding um, before the meeting. And that's really the first contact. And as we were all told growing up, you only get one chance at a first impression. So the initial intake is the first impression. And I know you're gathering demographic information, but the other part of it that you have to kind of put into that whole equation is any special needs that your new client might have. And so I would imagine it's your staff making those first introductory calls. And I make those calls in the job I'm doing now. And something that I have really learned that is so important is when I make that call to the person who's not, you know, they're just picking up the phone. I introduce myself. The first thing I say is, hi, my name's Jane and I'm calling from, and you tell them where you're calling from. And then you ask, is this, you know, Betty? or who am I speaking with? Because by introducing yourself to begin with, they know who you are, they know where you're calling from, and then they're more prepared to talk to you versus calling and saying, hi, is this Betty? You know, their guard's gonna go up. So it's really important to identify yourself to begin with and to speak slowly and clearly and deliberately you know, take a step back from that checklist that we all have, that we have to get through all of these things to ask for that intake process. Slow down and remember that you're gonna to need to maybe take a little bit more time with this person because you do this every day, but they don't. So you really need to take a minute to um, give them some time and that information in a really um, slow and clear way. They may be hard of hearing, they may need documents in large print. These are things that your staff should be asking. They might want it delivered to them in the mail. They might want email. It just depends on what their choice is and what their ability is. It can range the full range of hard copy mail, email, or maybe, you know, maybe they don't want to get it at all. Or maybe they want to write it down. Are they coming alone or are they coming with family? And how about parking? Where are they going to park when they come to this meeting? It's important to tell them these things so that they can be relaxed and comfortable when they get there and identify those things. Finding the office can be really challenging. We used to have an office in the atrium building in Walnut Creek, beautiful building with glass elevator shafts that came up and we did memory screenings every month. Well, the signage inside the building was so bad that when the senior came up and got out of the elevator, they couldn't find our office. And by the time they did find our office, they were so anxious and they were coming for a memory screening. So it didn't bode well for the results. So when we realized that we just made some sandwich board signs to put out on memory screening days and we put them out by the elevators with a few arrows pointing, made all the difference in the world. They were much more relaxed and comfortable. So those are the kind of considerations you need to think about before somebody even comes into your office so that you're better prepared. So um, some of the five senses that are related to um, sensory loss as we age are touch, taste, smell, hearing, and vision. And it's natural for our senses to change as we age, but really hearing and vision loss are the most that affect communication. So those are the two that I really want to address. Um, hearing loss is the most common disability in older adults. 50% of people over 75 have hearing loss. And I think it's probably gonna be worse, getting worse because we all use our earbuds for exercise or just to listen to podcasts. And 30% of 70 year olds, um, only 30% wear hearing aids. And a lot of that's attributed to the fact that Medicare doesn't cover the cost of hearing aids and they're very, very expensive. There are new over the counter um, hearing aids uh, that are starting to come out in the market and be more regulated. They still cost several hundred dollars, but it's certainly less expensive than a hearing aid. So hopefully that will help. There's a real negative impact for people who have hearing loss. Um, it, you know, it just kind of touches on all your aspects of life. Of course, physical, but emotional, mental health. And there's a real perception of, you know, mental uh, acuity 
and social um, skills, family dynamics and self-esteem that are affected when someone can't hear well. I worked with a woman um, named Sally who lived in San, uh, in San Pablo and she wanted to join the, the senior center because everybody told her it would be good for her and she could socialize, she was a widow. She had macular degeneration, but it wasn't too bad. The worst disability she had was uh, she was hard of hearing. So she got herself over there. She took the county link. She went to the senior center. She gave herself a whole month, um, attended the lunches, tried to do the games, but you know, big noisy room, hard for her to hear. And people treated her like she was stupid because she didn't hear them talking to her. So she wasn't responding or they thought she was a snob. So she just, they just kind of shunned her and she was really unhappy. And she said, if I'm gonna be isolated there, I might as well just stay home. So she was really struggling socially with her um, hearing loss. So it's something to remember. There's a lot of challenges for people to try to hear, be able to hear well. Uh, background noises are a real problem. I know when I phone people a lot, they have their TV on really loud or the radio. So I just asked them if they could turn it down because I, it's hard for me to hear them, which is true. And I'm sure it makes it hard for them to hear me. And they are always very obliging. Of course, they'll go turn it down. Um, speaker phones, I think, are a real problem. People have a hard time hearing on a speaker phone. And sometimes when you're wearing a headset and talking to people, they have a hard time hearing you. So you just need to kind of ask them if they can hear you and try to maybe use the receiver and work with them and ask them what's working for them. Uh, distractions are another problem. If you're in an office where people are walking by the window a lot, they will lose track and be distracted and not be focusing on you as the speaker. Stress and fatigue, you know, work, it's hard work to have to hear. And people get really tired and um, they're already coming to you for a reason that could be very stressful. So that's gonna make it difficult for them. And the lighting is interesting because uh, people tend to watch your face and they might be compensating by some lip reading. So if they can't see you too well, or uh, it's too much glare in their eyes so they can't see you, that's gonna make it difficult. So there's body language also that you can pay attention to. Obviously when people are tipping their head or repositioning themselves, they may be trying to get to their good ear so they can hear you better. That's one of the questions you can ask when they come in the office, where would you like to sit? Do you have a side that you prefer to have me be on so you can hear me better? All of those things. And they may ask you to repeat questions, which could be either they didn't understand it or they didn't hear you. But the blank looks, the disorientation, those inappropriate responses, the nodding, yes, 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 repeatedly, um, there's a good chance that they're not hearing you and they just think that they're going through the motions. It's that deer in the headlights look that um, I think everybody has seen on people that makes it, means that they may not be hearing what you're saying. But there are good communication practices. Make sure that they're looking at you and that you have their attention when you're speaking to them. It's really helpful. Speak clearly and slowly. And remember that you're not speaking to your peers. You're not, you're speaking to somebody who might be a compromise, but they also are learning this information for the first time. This is all new to them. So you need to slow down and explain it to them as if you were hearing something for the first time. And ask them if they can hear you. It's okay to start and stop and they'll tell you, you know, it's better to do that in the beginning than get, you know, into half hour into the meeting and then realize that they're not hearing what you're saying. And very importantly is to allow them time to respond. You know, they have to hear what you're saying, they have to process what you're saying, and they have to think about their answer, and then they'll answer. So I know I get caught up in that a lot when I'm making my calls, because I have a whole bunch of calls I have to make. And I, I ask the question, and it seems like a simple question, and I'm just waiting for their answer. So you just really have to step back, take a breath, and realize that you're working with people who aren't going to be as quick to respond as other people might be uh, that you talk to at other times. One of the best tools an office can get is um, a pocket talker. It's a really simple device. You can see it's very small, about the size of a deck of cards. And the um, older adult can just put that right, the headphones right on 
The little amplifier sits on the table. It's great for meetings about two to four people. Um, they only cost about $130. And I say only because when you consider the fact that each office could easily purchase one and have it you know, available in case it's needed, it's not something that everybody's gonna need. But when we started using these for memory screenings at senior services, it made all the difference in the world. And especially for obviously people who aren't wearing hearing aids. And it's a super simple device. It doesn't work well in big rooms. It doesn't work well where it's noisy, but that's not the scenario when you're doing intake. You're pretty much talking to two to four people in the room. So I think this is a really great idea for all offices, medical offices and everybody else to have. So the loss of vision, you know, that is just really um, gonna impact your daily life, your independence, um, you know, there's, it's such a huge topic, the loss of independence, but today I wanna to focus on um, the vision and I want you to consider being in your client's uh, shoes or in the examples I'm gonna use kind of in the driver's seat. Um, it really changes um, how your whole world is. So normal vision, you know, here's our scenario. You know, the client lives in Walnut Creek, your office is in Danville. They're gonna drive themselves to your meeting. And this is a lot of times what 680 could look like, you know, and the glare on the road, it just rained, you got all the traffic lights. And driving is one of the hardest things for people to give up. It means that they're, to them, it means they're losing their independence. Uh, they just want to get in their car, go to the doctor, go to the store, go to the beauty parlor, go to church. But maybe they're not safe to do that. And I think we've all um, heard stories about older adults who should probably not be driving, but they still are. So um, normal vision loss is, um, you know, we become more sensitive to glare and we need more light because our pupils start to get smaller. So there's a depth perception loss there. There's um, <clears throat> slower adjustment to light changes. And we also lose the ability to focus on objects nearby. You know, everybody's had the piece of paper that goes all the way out here and then you realize you need to get glasses. So that's your normal vision. And those are things that happen to us um, as we age in losing um, our capacity for clear vision. The big three um, conditions for older adults are cataracts, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. And they all share these similarities. They're, you become very uh, sensitive to glare and bright light. It's difficult to read, um, detecting stairs and low objects and the orientation problem in unfamiliar places. So imagine that you've managed to drive to the meeting at the attorney's office and you arrive at the office, you're either parking in the garage or you're out on the street. So you're coming into a building with light changes and that's really, you know, can slow you down quite a bit. You have to figure out navigating the lobby, uh, make it to the office. And now there's all this furniture that you're not familiar with. And you know, people asking you questions and greeting you. So there's a lot going on. All the areas are unfamiliar. So here we are driving to the meeting and we have cataracts. Now cataracts do this cloudy, hazy thing um, with yellowed vision. There've been a lot of improvements, um, which is nice because cataracts can be uh, corrected with outpatient surgery. So it's not as horrible as it used to be. But the problem with cataracts is you have to wait until the cataracts get big enough to have them removed. So you may end up having this, um, this foggy, this cloudy, hazy vision until your cataracts actually get big enough so that um, you can have the outpatient procedure. So imagine trying to drive with that. Glaucoma. Uh, loss of peripheral vision, obviously. It also has blurred vision. And these are this condition can be managed um, with either surgery or prescription drops. But imagine trying to tip your head back and put those eye drops in and you, it's hard enough to focus and see where you're putting them. Especially if you have a neurologic disease like Parkinson's and so your hands are a little shakier and it's a little harder to put them in. And maybe your spouse is there and can try it, can do it for you and that's great, but it's daily eye drops in a lot of cases. Uh, if you have kids, they'll have to come over and do it every day. And um, the caregivers from agencies are not allowed to administer medications. So 
um, you know, they can't be putting the drops in either. So it's a real problem. So let's imagine you have glaucoma and you're at your attorney's office and they hand you a document to read. That's how it's gonna look. So it's uh, really difficult. You have to turn your head, you know, constantly to be able to read a simple line. Uh, macular degeneration is the other one. Um, this dot gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So obviously central vision loss. Uh, there's two kinds. There's the wet macular degeneration, which comes on pretty quickly. And again, you can use some prescription drugs. It drops to, for that. And then there's the dry kind, which is a slow progression. And there's nothing you can do about that. Um, depth perception obviously is, is impaired and straight lines appear wavy or bent as you're trying to drive. So people do drive with these eye conditions. And uh, as obviously if they get their uh, driver's license checked or their doctor turns them into DMV, they're not gonna be driving. But um, if they can, a lot of times they do. Here we are trying to read our document at the attorney's office with um, macular degeneration. So you can imagine how challenging that is. It's almost easier if you have glaucoma, I guess, but that's um, what that would look like if you're looking at a document. So um, all of this leads up to how does it feel? So at this point, um, I think I asked everybody to bring cotton balls or um, Kleenex. So this is the part where you're gonna actually participate. So I'd like you to take your cotton ball and break it up a little bit or your um, Kleenex and just kind of put it in your ears so that you can become hard of hearing. And it'll be a little harder to hear me, which is a good thing. And after you get your ear, your hard of hearing uh, set up, then I want you to use your rubber bands. And this is going to simulate our arthritis. So you, I don't want it so loose that you can do that. I want you to kind of make it a little bit of a challenge for yourself. So this is crippling your hands a little bit with arthritis. So get your hands, you know, crippled up. If we weren't doing, if we didn't have COVID and we were in person, I have wonderful glasses that we could simulate. You could have macular degeneration, cataracts or glaucoma and do the same thing. So now I want you to take a pen or a pencil and with your arthritic hands, I want you to write down, I've got to write down three things. I want you to write down three of your cherished freedoms. Could be traveling, driving, hiking, um, family gatherings. So list those on a piece of paper. And then after you get those written down, three of your favorite possessions. Could be your house where you've lived for 50 years, or it uh, could be your car or, uh, an old car that you have that you love so much that was like the first car you ever had and you're lucky enough to be able to find another one. Um, it could be a hobby that you have. Maybe it's gardening or sewing. And now three loved ones, uh, your spouse, maybe your siblings, if you have children, a dear friends, uh, a dog or a cat. So list those and now think about the fact that Maybe you're gonna to have to move out of your house. Maybe you're gonna to have to move to a assisted living facility where you've gone from your nice house to basically the size of a studio apartment. And you have one room now. So what are you gonna take? What are you gonna to have to leave behind? Who's gonna be able to go with you? Um, all those things. They all change as we get older and we lose the ability to care for ourselves. And these could be the people that are coming into your office. And when you go home tonight, if you're home now, tonight when you're making dinner, just find some popcorn or some little beans and put them in your shoes and try walking around while you're cooking your dinner and see what it's like to have that kind of neuropathy on the bottom of your feet, that unsteady um, gait as you're trying to go about things that you would normally do. And I think that all of these um, techniques can be taken back to your office, can be used at a staff meeting. You can um, show your frontline staff, your people who call, the people who greet your um, clients when they come in, have them practice these things and see what it's like just to even have the minor impairments that we just experienced now so they can have a better understanding of who's coming in and who they're talking to. You wanna treat your older adult clients as you would want your family to be treated and you wanna see who they are, you wanna to listen to what they have to say, 
and you want to hear what they're talking about. And you need to slow it all down and step back for a minute and take all that in so that you can provide them with um, a better service. And by doing that, your whole intake process, you're going to end up getting more information than you ever thought or that you ever had in those check boxes on your list. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Are there questions, Samantha? Or? Thank you, Jane. There was one question in the Q&A, and that is, what strategies can you suggest for dealing with the client who is in denial of needing help? Wow. Well, I think, you know, Jill might be addressing that also, um, because that really goes into the whole capacity thing. So, uh, Jill, are you on? Do you have a, are you going to be kind of covering that? I think. She's think, nodding, so we'll say yeah, she will. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really more hers, but thank you. That's a really good question. And it's so important to understand how, how you can handle that and what are your options. So thank you. There, like, was, there was one question in the Q&A mm -hmm. and it was from Don Davidson and he wanted to know, and I think it's a great question. Does it make more sense to agree to meet in the client's home if that's feasible? Sure, if that's feasible, yeah, because you're cutting down on their um, on them having to leave and come to that whole new environment. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, the whole thing about going into somebody's home is then you really get to see who they are and where they are. You know, you'll get a whole bunch of extra information when you can go into somebody's home. And right now with COVID, that's a challenge. The other thing I didn't mention. Um, was you know, the whole having to wear masks right now. Um, if you are meeting face-to-face -face with somebody, it's, it, that adds a layer of um, difficulty in hearing, of course, and understanding. So I think we all are challenged with that, especially over the phone. I have to wear a mask at work and I'm making that phone call with a mask on. And I know that sometimes people have a hard time hearing me. But I think that one of the basic things to remember is you need to just slow down and ask people, is this working for you? Can you hear me? Um, and they'll tell you, you know, and then you're not wasting your time just launching on your questions without taking time to um, make sure that they're getting what they need to. But I think the home visit, of course, I always, I'm very pro home visit, if that's possible. And just to kind of add to what Jane is talking about, I actually had a client who um, had glaucoma and he had a history of sideswiping cars. Yeah. Everybody thought it was an issue with his capacity and his inability to drive, but we later discovered it, it wasn't really a capacity issue, it was a vision issue. Mm -hmm. And another client who had a hearing impairment, they thought lacked capacity because his responses to questions were not on point. And right. it's because he was mishearing what the questions were. So okay. once his hearing aids were, you know, we got him with hearing aids, he was totally on point and everything kind of resolved itself. So we do, you know, as attorneys, we should pay attention and make sure, um, you know, that, that the clients aren't challenged in a certain sense that if there is that we look into that, especially with loss of hearing and having to wear masks. If you're a lip reader, you can't do that anymore. So mm -hmm. it, pre it presents a challenge. So thank you, Jane, very, very helpful. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears to Jill Judson with CSC Fiduciaries. Jill, please take it away. Can you click on the screen? Can you see my screen? Good evening. I'm Jill Judson, and I am a professional fiduciary, and I'd like to thank everyone and the Contra Costa County Bar for the opportunity to speak with you today. Along with my two partners, Janice Kittredge and Diana Lowe, I own CSC Fiduciaries in Walnut Creek. I have been a fiduciary since 2015, and prior to that, I was a care manager with a nonprofit organization but the bulk of my career was uh, spent as a paralegal at, for a workers' compensation defense firm. In that capacity, I handled every aspect of a case with the exception of deposition and trial. 
but my main responsibility was the extensive review of medical records and the analysis of specific medical conditions. So with that, my parents, when my own parents became ill, my sisters looked to me to take care of our parents and deal with the doctors as my background with the medical records provided me with a solid foundation for knowing just enough to be dangerous. Um, for sure, I didn't know the answers, but I could figure out what questions to ask. And after caring for my parents and navigating through the system and various other family members asked me to do the same thing. And after a while of doing this, I wondered what do people do when they just don't have anyone? I started my own senior concierge business but with all of the insurances that I needed to make sure that I was protected, I realized that I had to go a different route. And that's how I discovered fiduciary work. It was this profession that's enabled me to help seniors and their families in time of need. So as my mother-in-law would say, once an adult, twice a child. In addition to what you see on this list, what else do these two have in common? Both of them need someone. They need someone to change their diapers and feed them. And while these two activities are way above my pay grade, I can be an advocate for them as well as ensure that all of their individual needs are met. For most of us, we take care of our parents. We do it for love and possibly obligation, but we do it. With that comes benefits and burdens. The benefits can be most rewarding as it is an opportunity to give back for what was given to you. Yet the burden can be enormous and it requires a lot of energy, time and resources. So what is a fiduciary? A fiduciary, as you know, is a person of trust. But a fiduciary also acts in the capacity as a trustee, an attorney in fact, a healthcare agent, executor, administrator, conservator, guardian, custodian, daily money manager, and a social security rep payee. But what Jill, really, yeah. Jill, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's kind of a low sound, a kind of a, a echoey ringing sound behind you. I don't know if it's your volume's too high or the mic, but look, yep. I don't know. Is it that? I think it's the fan on my computer because it's been on too long. Okay, well, let's keep keep going and see if it resolves itself. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. About that. Uh, so what really is a fiduciary? It's a friend, a confidant, advocate, a shopper, someone to take your call at 2 a.m., someone to sit with you in the hospital, and a hand holder. A fiduciary wears many hats. We are the boots on the ground. <clears throat> you as the attorneys draft the documents and we follow them, adhering to the wishes and desires of the individuals. Hold on, let me just see if it's this computer. Nope, it's my computer. We are the ones who clean out a house when someone dies, helps move an individual if they can no longer stay in the home, manage their investments, sell their home, coordinate their medical care, make the tough decisions on their behalf, and when we are also the ones holding their hand when they are dying. I often joke with my clients that I'm a rent -a daughter And many times I also refer to myself as a cruise director, as I typically have a team of individuals that I can outsource to assist me through an administration, whether it be the attorneys, the realtors, the movers, appraisers, nurses, care managers, investment and financial planners, and contractors. Unfortunately, the cruise ship is rarely the love boat, and it's usually the passengers, or in this case, the family members with their own self-interest, greed, and dishonesty that can cause the ship to sink. So how do I navigate through these murky waters? When a client first comes to speak with me, it is typically at the referral of an attorney or their friend. It is then up to me to gain their trust and respect to explain what I, as a fiduciary, can do for them. Usually, this type of client either foresees that there will be a problem upon their death or incapacity, as there are already some bad relationships in the family, or on the flip side, 
their family all get along and they don't want to upset that. Many times it is a blended family and the couple may not even agree upon what child can act as the successor trustee. Or in many cases, they just don't have anyone. I explain that I am here to honor their wishes and desires. Once I have gained their trust, their respect, and make them feel at ease, they are typically forthright with the information. However, what happens when a person has no capacity? The majority of the time, my incapacitated clients are totally convinced that they don't need me. Many times the family is in denial and don't realize that their loved one needs help. Typically the family is fighting about who should be taking care of mom or dad and the court appoints a neutral. No matter who I'm dealing with, I have to earn their respect and trust. And the only way to do this is to treat them the same way. Many times, especially with my dementia clients, it's 50 first dates. No matter how often I have been with them, there is no memory of me. Of course, I don't want to insult them, don't want to denigrate them, and I especially don't want to say to them, don't you remember? Of course they don't. By asking this, all I would be doing is making them feel bad about themselves. And when they start to feel bad, they start to clam up. And by doing that, they feel like they're making themselves look dumb. I always want to include them in a conversation and I always want to make sure that I am never speaking about them as if they're in the room, as if they're not in the room. But what happens with the family dynamics when there is a trust administration or a probate? Certainly the probate code doesn't even come close to telling us, uh, to provide us with any guidance whatsoever. And what happens when there is no family dynamics? When a client's entire family has predeceased them and they are simply alone. And what happens when the client doesn't want to know that there's, want anyone to know that they're sick and then we have to keep their secret. I actually have one terminally ill client who's instructed me to only disclose to her friends that she had been sick for years when she had passed away. When these friends ask me, why didn't we tell them that she was dying all along? I'm supposed to reply, would you have treated her any differently had you known? This is the same client who, when she was first diagnosed with terminal cancer, said to the doctor, I know that everyone wants to look 10 years younger, but honestly, doctor, can you keep me around long enough to make me 10 years older? Once again, everyone has their reasons and ideas of how they want their personal affairs to be managed. And I can guarantee you that no matter how similar the legal documents may look and how much boilerplate you include for each client, the administration is never the same. As attorneys, you're, you aren't dealing with the day-to-day -day activities. You aren't there for the clients when they are ill and the fiduciary is making those medical decisions at a moment's notice while the doctor is on the phone or dealing with a family who has ignored someone for years and then wanna call the shots, or the one who shows up at a property where a family member greets you while swinging a hammer in their hand, threatening to tear down the fence since he has installed the fence 20 years prior for his mom and didn't want the family to benefit from the sale of the house if the fence was still there. Obviously the fiduciary is the one who's responsible for the human side of all the interactions. That said, I will describe three situations uh, dealing and how I dealt with the family dynamics. Mom and dad have two sons, Fred and Barney. They have an incredible amount of animosity towards one another. Mom has dementia. Dad knows that upon his death, mom will plummet and not be able to function. One son, Fred, is at his parents' side at all times. He even lost his job helping his parents while dad was in hospice so that his mother wouldn't be alone. The other son, Barney, had not had contact with his parents for 15 years. He is bitter and he doesn't even show up at his father's deathbed when his parents called for him. He doesn't want anything to do with them, with them, but was then angry when the social worker who had been working with the parents previously didn't inform him of the details of the funeral. After calling the mortuary, Barney shows up at the funeral. And this is where you have all seen it in a movie. Mom is with Fred, she gets out of the car, sees Barney from across the parking lot, and suddenly the last 15 years are forgotten. And Fred, the son who's been there through thick and thin, is left alone. 
Following the service, the estranged son Barney comes over, introduces himself, and his first comment to me is, it's not about the money, but will my mother have enough to be okay? Hmm, red flag. So really, it's not about the money. Nothing, next thing I knew, Barney and his wife were trying to take control of his mother's finances. They had contacted the assisted living where they wanted her to move so that she could be geographically closer to them. They started to tell the caregivers that they were coming over and wanting to take mom out. And they would appear at the house unannounced. As the days progressed, I became the middleman between two angry and very bitter sons, fighting over all of mom's things without even acknowledging that their mother was still alive. They wanted to remove things from the house and no matter what one son wanted, the other one wanted it more, just so that the other couldn't have it. I couldn't let them into the house and accompanied for fear of what they would take. The estranged son, Barney, was so angry that one day he actually threatened me and said he would meet me at the house with his sawzall so that he could cut all of the furniture in two just so that his brother didn't get it. So maybe it wasn't about the money, but it was certainly not about mom either. In this case, I had to deal with each family member separately. I had to be a good listener and validate what each son was telling me but make it work so that mom, who at that point had quickly spiraled downhill, was spared. Although she was certainly suffering from dementia and the grief of her husband dying, watching or even overhearing her son's arguing was just killing her. I would sit down with her, listen to her stories over and over again, and determine what was special to her and what she wanted. I spoke with each son, developed a strict visitation schedule so that the two brothers' paths would never cross. And in the nicest way possible, I told them that I was in control, that I was respecting their parents' wishes, and that I was the decision maker. As we proceeded to move mom to a facility, even with her dementia, we asked her what items she wanted to keep in her own apartment, not what her sons wanted. It took time, but eventually the sons realized that they could not control the situation and that everything was going to be done methodically, compassionately, and thoughtfully. Today, mom is still alive and thriving in the assisted living. We have a private nurse that comes in to see her on a regular basis and a nighttime caregiver to keep her safe as she has a tendency to sleepwalk. We check in with the family on a regular basis and let them know how she's doing, yet we rarely receive any acknowledgement. We are not sure if the sons check in with the mom or not since she has no recollection if they call. However, she is thriving. She has friends at the facility, and most of all, she has a quality of life. Another example is a mom who has three daughters. She loves them all equally, or so she says. And one daughter lives in the, in the UK. During her lifetime, mom had given two of her daughters each a home to live in. And upon her death, she provided the UK daughter with rental property. Although the daughters all got along, mom also knew that if one of them was put in charge, any relationship that the sisters had would be destroyed. Since mom didn't want the girls to have any disagreements, she entrusted a fiduciary to handle the affairs. The best way to handle the situation was to keep the daughters appraised of, all, of the process of the administration. At times, they didn't understand why it was taking so long. But with proper communication, we sailed through the administration distributed the remaining assets and prepared the final tax returns. In this particular case, there was no fighting. And my primary role was to ensure that the administration was handled efficiently and economically, and to make sure that each daughter understood the process so that their relationship was not negatively impacted by their mother's death. And then there's the lonely mom, Ruth, a 95-year-old sharp, witty and totally put together woman who lives in an assisted living facility. She escaped from Germany in 1937 by herself when she was 12 and she is alone. Her husband died about 10 years ago and her two loving daughters also predeceased her. One dying at age 40 and the other dying at age 61. She has a few friends that call her daily but sadly a lot of her girlfriends have passed away or are showing signs of dementia. She has grandchildren that don't live close by. One calls weekly and the other seems to call around holiday time, which just destroys her. So here there is absolutely no family dynamics. 
Ruth's greatest concern is that she is going to outlive her money and fears that she is going to die alone. So who takes care of Ruth? Who does her banking, her investing, and who does the assisted living call when she isn't feeling well and needs to go to the doctor? Who picks her up from the emergency room at 3 a.m. when there's no transportation available to take her home? And how do we handle that? Well, I must say that Ruth has earned a special place in my heart. I assure her on a regular basis that she will not be alone and that I will be there for her always. And honestly, I am. She trusts me and I have given her and I've never given her any reason not to. We review her finances on a regular basis. I show her accounting. I even have the financial planner call her quarterly. Even if his explanations are sometimes over her head, I still want her to feel worthwhile, independent, and most of all, respected. Trust is earned, and the more comfortable the client feels, the more comfortable they will be to tell you even the most confidential information. Asking too many questions at once can be frustrating if they can't find the answer. So asking questions in a way that allows a yes or no works well. Too many options can also be confusing. So narrow down an answer to a simple choice. And most of all, don't argue. Even if you know that the information is incorrect or simply unreasonable, arguing usually makes it worse. You have to realize that being mean or unreasonable can be the disease talking. And family members need to be assured that it is just that, the effects of the disease. And it's impossible to reason with an unreasonable person. The stories and the need to deal with each case scenario in each set of family dynamics is endless. But no matter who they are and what the circumstances are, if the family or the individual client does not feel like they are being respected or even heard, then my job gets even harder. Being transparent, discussing what I can with family without violating the HIPAA laws, discussing their financing, finances, but still speaking in generalities is an art and truly only comes with experience, but communication is the key. Where we are in the process of an administration and telling them what they can expect next usually keeps everything at bay. Of course, there are still those unhappy family members that will not take what I tell them as the answer and I can be threatened and that's when I call you, the attorneys, to either save me or to at least provide me with some guidance. Prior to that call though, my usual re response to the unhappy family member is that we can simply take the matter to court and let the judge decide. 90% of the times they start to back down and it usually is quiet after that. Months ago, I was called by a client who wanted me to know that he was going to avail himself to the end of life option act. He said that he had terminal cancer, was in a lot of pain, and after watching his wife die a long and painful death, he had decided that he was not going to do that. I told him that I was actually familiar with the subject as I had attended several seminars regarding just that subject. This made him more at ease, and he said that if the pain got bad enough, he would let me know. So two weeks ago, around 1130 in the morning, I got a call from him and he said that today was the day and that the nurse was on her way. He wanted to make sure that I remembered where everything was in his house and he basically wanted someone to talk to until the nurse got there. We went through the combination of his safe, where he was going to leave his wallet, and most importantly, he wanted me to know that he had made his quarterly tax return payment. The nurse arrived and introduced herself to me on the phone and said that she would be with him until the mortuary arrived. The gentleman once again got on the phone and said that he had a lot of faith in me and trusted that I would take care of all of his wishes. I assured him that I would and indicated that I was honored to be there for him. Unable to know what else to say, I wished him a smooth transition and hoped that he would be with his wife again. He thanked me and he said, I hope to see you on the other side. Three hours later, the nurse called and told me he had peacefully passed away. He passed with dignity and he did it his way. Although I did not have the opportunity to build a long time relationship with this client, he has made an impact on me. And each client does this in one way or another. I've spoken with his family and once again, I will be dealing with his family dynamics. Due to his religious background, one of his siblings has told me not to tell the other sibling how he passed. So again, choosing my words and showing compassion will be the key to gaining the family's respect. 
when I'm involved in a litigation case and see all the fighting over money or who gets what or who controls what, as attorneys, please remember one thing. Who is this case all about? Far too often the family members think that it is about themselves and what they can get. Typically though, it's not about them. And what is forgotten is that there is a human being behind every one of your cases and the value of their life and the value of their relationship and their contributions to this world should never be forgotten. If you take away one thing from this evening's presentation, it is to remember that your case is truly about people. Ultimately, it's all about people. Oops. Thank you, Jill. Very powerful program. As I'm sure some of the family law practitioners who are watching know, um, we deal with family and family dynamics way too often. And so Jill has provided some helpful techniques on, on you know, dealing with those dynamics. So thank you for that. But Jill, we've got some questions for you as well. We'll start off with the one that we passed from the previous one, which is from Craig. Uh, what strategies can you suggest for dealing with a client who is in denial of the need for help? Um, again, it's listening to them. It's, you know, we uh, have a case where I have a case right now with a wife who is very, very ill and the husband needs a lot of help, but he thinks he can talk to her and he thinks he can take care of her and he can't. So it's a matter of trying to provide him with the resources to help her, but knowing that um, ultimately we have to um, try to work together with him. He's pretty unruly, but it's, you, you just have to, Again, it's like 50 first dates. You have to repeat it over and over again because he thinks he's just fine. So um, it's just a matter of being consistent, but approaching them with respect and you know understanding and hoping that in time he'll finally get it. I think building the relationship, like you've been saying, and getting that respect is important. So another question we have is, do you ever help a client without capacity who is married with a competent spouse? Yes, we do. Um, there's many times that um, the competent spouse just doesn't want to be doing it anymore. She wants to be living their life or he wants to be living their life and, and needs somebody to step in. So it happens a lot. Um, it's just too much for them and uh, they, they need help. Um, I have a situation right now where there's actually two sisters and one sister is totally, um, she's having a really hard time because she can't manage another person's life. And um, she has turned it over to us. It's just too much. So it's sort of the same thing as well. Um, we keep them, we consult them and we make sure that we follow what, how they knew them and how they would like to be treated or, or what their desires are, what their wishes are, what their favorite things are. So we can actually use some guidance as opposed to when we just get a client and we know nothing about them and it's kind of a Sherlock Holmes situation. So it does, it does help actually having competent people around. We have another question uh, from Shivani. Do you have legal authority to be able to limit the visits with children or do you have to rely on family being reasonable and cooperating? I'm wondering what options you would, you would have if, if it had sons that were not willing to comply. And we go to court. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the conservatorship and then we'll, we can go to court. Um, I have another family that lives in Nevada right now. And uh, none of the children get along and uh, we have to arrange for a visitation. And, you know, mom doesn't even want some of the kids around. So um, right now, because of COVID, we're doing, you know, FaceTime chats, but we limit it. We can limit it. And the judge has, you know, basically encouraged me to make sure that we just have a visitation schedule. So. The next question is, is there a range of cost for a professional fiduciary? 
range. So we charge by the hour. I've always thought of myself as a 0.1 person, just like all of the attorneys out there. So um, yes, we charge uh, with what is permitted by Contra Costa County. And um, our hourly rate is 175 to 195 an hour. I happen to have 10 employees in our group. So we are able to do things a little bit more cost efficiently. So if it does not require my license to do a particular task, I can have some of my other employees to do it, which then makes it um, less expensive. So um, we have a care manager and then I have individual that only does our accountings. If you had to pay me to do an accounting, it would be a lot more expensive, but that's all she does is accountings. She's not charged out at the $175, $195 rate. So um, the countings are done more efficiently and more cost effectively. And then we also have um, other individuals that go to the houses, help clean out the houses uh, so that they're not paying as high rate. Um, so that it tends to work in our favor and that our clients are definitely served better. Great. And then we have another question from Kelly that asks, um, I've never worked with a, a professional fiduciary. I'm interested in how you're paid. We are paid. If it's the conservatorship, we're paid out of the conservatorship, out of those funds that we are managing. Um, we are, if it's a trust, we're paid out of the trust. Um, our fees are approved by the court when it is a court supervised, either a trust or a conservatorship. Otherwise, if it's a private trust, then we are paid by the trust. Um, we have monthly invoices. Uh, when it's a conservatorship though, we wait until we have the, the fee petition and, and the approval from the court. Otherwise, um, sometimes we do get periodic fees. We have, I found a, there's a question in the chat that says, is the specific work of a fiduciary specified in the court order of a conservatorship? Meaning how does she know what her responsibilities are? I'm not sure I understand. Um, they, yeah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, I do have, if I understand the question right, I mean, I can be provided with dementia powers um, so that we can, give um, authorization for certain medications, um, antipsychotic medications, other medications that a demented individual might need. Um, so I guess it, I'm not sure I'm answering the question correctly, but. Um, I think that sometimes there are specific duties in the order and sometimes they're not, but it sounds right. like you're generally tasked with taking care of the yeah, person. Yeah, definitely, right. And it, the only addition to that would typically be then the, um, the dementia powers. And that's one thing, especially when we do have elderly patients, you know, that we want to make sure we have those powers because it will come up that all of a sudden, as I had said earlier, the disease can be talking and you suddenly see this behavior that you never knew was out there. We have another question from Lara. How often do you get periodic payments? Depends on what my attorney has put in for me. So I'm hoping that an attorney will put in that I get monthly periodic payments. Um, if they don't, then I have to wait till the end, um, which is usually 18 months. Um, but um, yeah, so usually periodic payments would do me well. Otherwise, we <laughs> we're, there's always a big lag. So, and that was nice. Another Lara question. just wrote, you deserve every penny and it's hard to wait. <laughs> so, thank you. Another question from Donald is, do you ever manage client investment accounts? And if so, do you charge as asset based, an asset-based fee? No, we do not manage. We have our experts. Um, I, I refer to, uh, we usually work with Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo Advisors. Those are the two that we normally work with. And um, we rely on their expertise to tell us how much and how we should be um, managing their assets. So yeah, we are not, I'm not licensed to do that, so. 
Another question has come in. What is the process for someone who wants to have a fiduciary nominated as successor trustee in their estate plan? Usually I will get contacted by either the attorney or the client. Um, they will call and I will make an appointment and speak with them and inform them what I actually do. Many times the attorney has does explain to them what a successor trustee does. And so if not, then they contact us. And if it's a good match, then they will go back to their attorneys and include our, you know, will be named in their in the documents. And Jane, now we have a question for you. Question from Sally, what do you feel an attorney taking on an older adult as a client most needs to know? I think as Jill's been saying also, it's a lot about the communication, the trust, the listening um, to really, I think the biggest part is to allow enough time. Um, when you're doing the intake process to allow that extra time that probably is gonna be needed to work not only with the older adult, but with the family and anybody else involved in the process because it's not, a, it's not something you can rush through in that initial visit. And I think I find that every single day at work, I always have to kind of remind myself I need to slow down and step back. So I think that's one of the biggest things to remember is you're dealing with a different time scale on that intake process. And I think sometimes just for me, I think some of my elder clients will have good days and bad days. I think right. there's sometimes there's a good day and it's, it's fine. We have a great conversation. And then the next day they may not be feeling as well. And it's, it's just probably a, not a good day. So I think pu putting that, you know, making sure that you're mindful of that. If you have a deadline that you may want to give yourself a little bit more time in order to make sure that your clients you know, able to properly communicate with you and share what it is that they want done. Um, if it's a court case or whatever their needs are in your scope of representation that you allow for that extra time as, as Jane has said. Yeah, I agree completely on that, yeah. Okay, do we have any other questions? Did you, did you get the question about managing client investment accounts? I did, I believe okay, I did, sorry. yes. It's that. Doug, do you want to share any stories about intake or, or working with fiduciaries for the panel? I mean, for the attendees? Yeah, sure. Um, can you can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Yep. So yeah, um, I think one thing with, uh, as, as the panelists have already indicated, uh, with regards to uh, having an elder client, uh, especially when it comes to litigation, uh, a lot of times we are very... Uh, constrained with time, you got deadlines. Um, and so giving yourself uh, and your client enough time, uh, as everyone has indicated, to uh, fully grasp what you need from them, uh, what they're signing, uh, why they're signing it, uh, what, what the end goal is, and to ensure that they are constantly um, aware of the process. Um, we as practitioners tend to uh, not go into as much detail just because we're familiar with, you know, the process. Um, but a lot of times you gotta, you gotta be cognizant of the fact that this is very new for them. Um, this is a, the court system is a scary process, uh, whether it's a restraining order or some, or conservatorship or whatever. Um, it's, it's really just taking the time um, to give them what I ultimately hope is the peace of mind. And uh, every person is different in what peace of mind is for them, but finding out what, what it is and then trying to achieve that. Um, as, it, as it refers to fiduciaries, um, as, as Jill has pointed out, um, a lot of times when I'm intaking a situation, uh, the first thing I ask is, why are we here? Uh, what, what has gone awry or, or who are the players that we need to focus on um, because more often than not, it is a, a lack of communication and, and transparency in some form or fashion. And so if we can get to the root of the problem so that everyone is on the same page with uh, the issues and whatnot, more often than not, um, that, that saves you in the long run just because 
again, transparency and communication, people may not like what you're saying, but you're being truthful to them and explaining to them, hopefully in a reasonable way, uh, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and, you know, if they're represented by counsel, then, uh, you know, that counsel is appreciative as well as, all right, we're going to court for this specific issue because it's vague or we have concerns or these allegations. So um, as both panelists have mentioned, um, and for all the practitioners out there, um, communication transparency, whether it's with your client um, who's elderly or whether it's with a fiduciary, um, again, nine, nine times out of 10 in my experience, uh, most issues are uh, resolved or at least um, mellowed out if, if everyone can understand you know, the method to the madness. Hopefully that provides some insight. Great. And Lara has a good question. Um, do any of you have a good litmus test for whether or not it is appropriate to work with an older adult, adult who seems very forgetful or borderline demented? Any practical tips? I, I can say for myself, uh, whenever that uh, red flag or danger, danger in my brain goes off, uh, first thing I ask is, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to, to work with you, but uh, because we don't want, you know, any, any allegations down the road, let's get a, a doctor's declaration from your primary care physician um, saying that you can, you know, you can contract or you can make your decisions, et cetera, because um, you know, we, we want to avoid, uh, areas of litigation before they occur. And usually, um, you know, if the client is, is legitimate and doesn't have, you know, actual cognitive issues, uh, they'll be happy to do so. Um, and if not, then in all likelihood, you probably have, have dodged a, you know, potential litigation issue. Great, so Emily raises the question, do you have any suggestions for how to handle a competent spouse who is interfering with assessment appointments for a spouse with dementia where the children of a former marriage are the fiduciaries? Uh, a good question, Emily. <laughs> Jane or Jill, do you guys have any suggestions? You're both on mute. I, th I defer to Jill because I, 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 I was so going to ask you to me. reread the question. No problem. Let me reread that question. It's a, good it's a storybook problem. <laughs> so let me get back to the question. Do you have any suggestions for how to handle a competent spouse who was interfering with assessment appointments for a spouse with dementia where the children of a former marriage are the fiduciaries? Welcome to elder law. <laughs> I think you just have to put your foot down. It's kind of like what I had to do with, with those two sons. Um, you know, these are things that have to be done. And if they feel that she's, you know, if he feels that she's not um, incapacitated, then the doctor will tell us. Um, so let's let her get assessed and, and we'll find out for sure. I mean, that's, you, you have to move forward. You can't be stagnant. So you've got to do something. So I agree. And I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, sharing of that burden, quote unquote, can be done by other professionals. You know, no uh, older adult wants their children telling them how to live. You know, nobody wants your kids parenting you. So if you can defer to the doctor or you can defer to a fiduciary or a social worker, um, a professional case manager if you don't need the fiduciary, then a lot of times those uh, professional people can make a lot of headway with the family, uh, with the older adult, you know, the couple, because it's not their kids telling them. And so sometimes, yeah, you have to defer to the doctor and you have to get the doctor on board. And usually that's not too difficult to do. We have an attendee asking, so using the client's own doctor is sufficient? So for me, um, I always say, yeah, use the primary care physician just because that individual usually uh, knows the client the best. Um, and you can always fall back on that and say, well, this was the individual who had seen this doctor for, or seen this patient for the last 15 years. 
Um, I know in litigation, um, one of the red flags I always look for is, who, is was this doctor a brand new doctor? Uh, you know, uh, and then the question is, well, who hired the doctor? Was it the patient? Was it the, the alleged uh, abuser? Who was it? So I always refer back to the primary care physician and usually he or she will um, either be able to draft a letter or if they're uncomfortable, will uh, you know, refer it to a, a neuropsych. And when in doubt, um, I'll just hire a neuropsych, Dr. Freetag, who's speaking next week or, or, or someone else. Yeah, I would, oh, sorry. Sorry, I would agree with Doug. The, the, using the client's um, doctor is usually the best first step. They're most familiar with their medical history. Um, but please, Jill, Jane, feel free. No, to I that. totally agree. And I was going to say, um, that's a perfect segue to Dr. Freetag next week. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many reports I have seen that he has written after the neuropsych eval. And those are used a lot of times in the capacity, um, you know, argument or where the family's trying to prove capacity or not. So, yeah. Uh, the next question is, are there any doctors with expertise in evalu evaluating clients for competency? Come back next week. You, you'll, you'll meet one. <laughs> yeah, yes. He's a great speaker. Yeah, he's a great speaker. And uh, there are doctors who do just that. And, you know, I'll say from my standpoint of working at John Muir Health for the last 15 years um, and helping people find doctors, a lot of the, uh, com the relationship with the doctor, as I, you know, because people would call senior services and they would say, I don't like my doctor, I need a new doctor. And we're not really allowed to refer them to a specific doctor. But the whole uh, idea is that it's all about the relationship. And I used to tell people, you know, the standard line was, I, you know, those shoes look great on my girlfriend, but they pinch my feet. So why am I wearing them? You know, I could have a doctor that I absolutely love, but then I do have a doctor I love. And I know somebody who had her and didn't like her at all. So you really have to start with that whole relationship. And, um, you know, it's made easier now. There's a lot of videos that you can watch, at least on the John Muir Health website, you can watch the videos of the doctors and help your family members pick a good doctor. And I think um, a lot of times it's too overwhelming. So you narrow down those choices and you, sh you know, let the family kind of siphon through a few, find three doctors that they think would be good for mom or dad and then you show mom or dad those three videos and you let them kind of pick which one they kind of like. And if they have a good relationship, then the doctor is going to be able to evaluate them a lot better. And then it, when it comes time for these capacity issues or as things start to change, then they've already got that good relationship with the doctor. So I really think that people shouldn't waste time with doctors that they can't work with because as you get older and down the road, you're going to need that good relationship to really fall back on when you need that legal backup. I would agree. We have a question from Svetlana. Would this sending a client to assessment be eventually used to say that even lawyers had reasonable concerns about their client's capacity? Um, I, I mean, for, for one, sure, you can make the, yeah. I mean, as a lay person, I have no problem saying, hey, I'm not a doctor and I don't know if this person has capacity, which is why I refer to an expert. And as long as the expert comes back and says, you know, yeah, this person has capacity. Well, then the motive is, is really just precautionary. So, um, you know, I think anyone can make the argument. I just don't think it kind of holds its weight all that well, because at the end of the day, the 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 most uh, you know qualified individual to determine capacity has ultimately determined such. And I think it's important to get that assessment early on. Obviously, if you have any concerns, because if you take them on and you go down and you've done all this work for them, and you get to the end of the work, like say for example, you're creating the estate plan or you're 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 creating a contract or something that's you know you're doing for your elder and then their capacity comes to be at issue, 
then that can be a problem because now you're at the end of it and do you have to undo everything or what, what happens now? So getting that assessment earlier, it covers all bases and it protects your clients so that there's no issues about whatever scope of work you're retained to do, but it also protects you as a practitioner that you're not the medical expert to, to determine whether they have the capacity, but now you've got this assessment um, that, that the doctors made that your client does or does not have capacity. Laura has and, another and, question. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I was gonna say, and to, to add to that, um, because as uh, you know, for estate planning, especially um, in issues where, as a litigator, um, you know a lot of a lot of estate planners never actually go to court. They they farm out litigation or whatever, and um, so as a litigator, we get to see kind of where estate plannings go go wrong or you know those hot issues. And so, whenever a client comes in uh, an elderly where there's maybe concern about cognition, or they're going to disinherit a child that you know is going to you know going to fight it later on. Um, there's a few practical tips that I do. Number one, um, as Samantha, you indicated uh, right off the bat, um, before we start the process, I, I request a doctor's note or letter confirming that he or she has capacity. Um, secondly, I slow the process down. What I don't want is for the disinherited child or whomever to say, oh, well, mom or dad was unduly influenced to change this, blah, blah, blah. Um, knowing that I would likely be called as a witness, I can then say, hey, we took four months to do this. We had multiple meetings. You know, my client's position was consistent the entire time, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, what I do is right before we're going to sign the documents, I then get another doctor's note um, so that there's no argument that, oh, they lacked the, the or they lost capacity during the process. So I try to make, uh, quite frankly, a number of prophylactic measures to uh, avoid litigation down the road. And as um, the former judge Sugiyama uh, had mentioned in one of the brown bag luncheons, it is also a good thing if they're going to disinherit someone or change something dramatically to explain it in the document, why they're doing it. And so I ask for a detailed explanation on why they're changing this so much. Um, so that when, you know, they're gone and this is litigated, uh, the explanation is in the document itself. Just another example of communication being really important. It's communicating the wishes and then putting the reasons behind it. Good points, Doug. So Lara has a question. There was some mention of HIPAA considerations in talking with family members. Do any of you have any good advice on how much or how little to involve family members in the beginning stages? Any tips for balancing concerned family and independent older adults? Well, I think some of it should be is that we actually speak with the person alone and find out what they feel comfortable with us telling their family. Sometimes there's, uh, you know, even conservatives that are like, oh, tell them everything. I want them to know. Um, other times it's like, I don't want my kids to know anything just like my client that doesn't want her friends to know anything. So um, it's a matter of seeing first what they want and um, they call the shots. And uh, so that's the first step and that's what we do first. Um, but otherwise then you have to speak in generalities because we don't want to necessarily um, tell some information that they wouldn't want out there. So it really does depend on each case. And, and because I represent fiduciaries, the one thing I would add to that is make sure whatever their request is, is in writing so that the fiduciary uh, has it uh, so that if anyone ever questions you, you, again, everyone lies, prove it to me in documentation. Okay, and then we have a comment from Sally who is saying, please impress upon attendees that the first meeting with that older adult must be solely the attorney and the older adult. For attorneys, that solo meeting is critical. And Sally, I completely agree with you. I, I do think it's very critical to meet with clients alone. Um, there are times though, I will say that I'm in that respect building process where we're just kind of getting to know each other and I may have other family members involved just to kind of learn the dynamics. But I absolutely do meet with the elder alone um, in the room 
And it usually works better after we've developed a little bit of a relationship and I'm more familiar with the dynamics so I can kind of know what questions to ask, kind of assess the, the dynamics in the room, um, who brought the elder, how much the elder speaking versus the elder's family members or whoever came with them, kind of just watching it all play out as, as I try and figure the case um, out. So I completely agree, it is critical that attorneys meet with clients alone um, and make sure that they're not the subject of any undue influence from the people who are bringing them to their appointments or who drove over with them or whatever the case may be. In fact, I was um, able to figure out a few cases where the person driving the elder to the appointment was really the bad guy. I mean, it, it, it eventually came out, but you have to build that relationship and you have to build that level of trust to get there so that your client does tell you more and trusts you more with the information. So um, good point, Sally. Okay, guys, we're about three minutes over our time. I want to thank everyone for coming out. And I especially want to thank uh, Francesca, Jane, Jill, and the board and everybody else who put this great first program together. We'd love to see you next week. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much.